Tired of traditional talk? People pontificating about this or that, the left or the right. Sometimes the truth is just all lost in the noise. Having learned life lessons the hard way, Chuck Gallagher, international speaker and author, cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency. Nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. So tune in, turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Now, here's your host, Chuck Gallagher. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. I want you to imagine for a second. Imagine you're a police officer, and the newest member of your department is a practicing black Muslim. What biases, stereotypes, or assumptions might come up for you or for some in the department? What would, what would you do to enhance your knowledge about the person? Or maybe the better question is, would you even care to enhance your knowledge about the person? Now, I'd like to be the person to take credit for writing that really great opening. But in reality, my guest today wrote that as one of the pieces that she was doing as a, as a vignette, I guess, in a workshop. And and it's interesting because she went on to say in some of the prolific work that she's done that some of the uh, participants were steadfast in their belief about the individual. Uh, Some voiced that, well, he might be a terrorist. Um, The others said, well, I don't know, he might stop us uh, or stop our response to an emergency so he can pray. Um, He might not treat women in the workplace with respect. All of these are certain stereotypes that we have, and, and it, it, it causes me to think about the, uh, the very popular TV show, Homeland, when you, you, know, you see the guy coming on and he's the war hero, and then as the program develops, it's, it's an intricate model of seeing, well, what is it if you're a practicing Muslim, and how do people see you, and do you have the ability to walk well, I'm what I would call normally in the United States. And, and I have to say, I think as we begin this show, this is a show on diversity. It's a show on race. It's a show on inclusion. It's a show on the biases that we all have. And I'm going to say that we all have biases. Um, I think we come to this world as babies with a completely clean hard drive and somehow in the process of what's put into it, the programs that are put into it, who we are reared by, what environment we live in, is going to create to some extent some of the stereotypes and biases that we have. And so it's going to be a great show. Uh, I want to say that um, uh, my guest today is Lenora Billings Harris. Now, she is the queen of diversity. That's my way of putting it. But she's an international speaker and consultant who specializes in helping organizations make diversity a competitive advantage. Her books, gosh, they are used by executives all over the world, HR professionals, uh, chief diversity officers in the world. Her clients have been West Point, FedEx, McDonald's, Marriott, Disney, the American Embassy in Israel, and the U.S. Bureau of Prisons, which I happen to be a participant of many years ago. Not that I'm proud of it, but it did create a unique environment to learn about stereotypes, racial attitudes, and what it means to be a minority. Lenore is the president of the Global Speakers Federation. She was included among the top 100 thought leaders on diversity by the Society of Human Resource Management and has appeared on the cover of Diversity Woman magazine and selected as one of the 20 top diversity experts in the United States. And Lenora, I have to say, and I've said this many times, I, I always want to thank you because my first introduction to the National Speakers Association when, was when you were president of NSA and had a program out in San Diego 
uh, speaking with soul and substance. And I have to tell you that uh, that introduction into our profession was profound, and I am deeply indebted and appreciative to you bringing that to the uh, to the surface. So thanks for joining us today. I, I, this is such a highlight for me. Wow! Hi, Chuck. And uh, you know, every time you remind me that uh, the convention for which I was president was your first convention, it just warms my heart that it it impacted you so profoundly. Because of course, every year at National Speakers Association, each president wants to have their convention be the best ever. And years later, I do appreciate hearing hearing those stories. So st- let me let me jump right in here, um, talking about stereotypes and so forth. Now, for your listeners to be clear, I was working with the Bureau of Prisons, not a prisoner. <laughs> oh, I got, that part I got. I was the prisoner. You were the, right. <laughs> you were the person that was trying to help us crazy people. <laughs> now, Lenora, you know, obviously a lot of your work is focused on this whole issue of diversity and stereotypes and racial biases. And and I really kind of want to go back to what I'm going to call the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I mean by the beginning is, is all of us at, at our various ages, when we were born, were born into the families of our birth. We didn't necessarily choose that, so to speak. But but the reality is we were born there and there were people who influenced us to have certain beliefs. And it's almost like each generation has had deep-seated beliefs that tend to have, a, at least it appears, tend to have eroded generation by generation. But yet there's still a lot that's there that as individuals create our model of the world or how we see the world. So help connect the dots a little bit with how that happens. You bet, you bet. You know, when you when you opened and you talked about, and you made the statement, all of us have biases, we absolutely do. But to your point, we are born with a clean slate. And we have to have biases to get through the world. The challenge is we have some biases that when they pop up in our head as adults, we don't question them. We just act on them when, in fact, we should question them. Let me give you an example that that's not a hot, uh, hot potato kind of. Well, actually, it is kind of a potato. You'll see what I mean when I when I share it. Um, I always say to my to my groups when I'm speaking to them, how many of you have ever wanted to lose five pounds, which, as you would imagine, especially in the U.S., at least 90 percent of the people raise their hand. Right. Well, right. You know, and then I I say, well, um, how many of you? had a parent, a grandparent, a guardian tell you when you were a child to clean your plate. And depending on the age group, actually, of the audience, most people raise their hand. Now, I do find that younger people, the millennials and uh, younger Gen Xs, their parents have learned, and so they don't necessarily give their students, their children, the message to clean your plate. But I'm a baby boomer, and, and so for my generation, my parents and my grandparents said, well, clean your plate. Their motivation to say that was because they wanted me to learn to be frugal, to not waste. Well, why would they want me to learn that? Well, certainly for my grandparents, they came through the depression. So their value system was don't waste. Now, here's the thing. So we're, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. So we're, oh, darn. Lenora, I love that. That is so cool. Okay, it's how do you do that? That's a radio show. Your phone goes off and it's followed the yellow brick road. Oh my goodness, that rocked. I love that. Well, I turned my phone on for a few seconds before we started, so in case you called me and I forgot to turn it back off. So, oh, no, that is classic. So, shall I keep going? You keep going, girl. Oh, okay, so I'll keep. It's just it's the world we live in, isn't it? And it so, is. So in any case, so we get this message of of cleaning our plate and our parents or grandparents are trying to teach us to be frugal. But here's the thing. As we become adults, we keep cleaning our plate Mm -hmm. because we never question that voice that comes on in the back of our head that's telling us to clean our plate, even though as adults we know, well, maybe I shouldn't eat all of this. Maybe I should put some away or throw it away or whatever the case may be, and then we end up being overweight. Now, here's the point I'm making. We get all kinds of messages. 
from those those folks in our environment who love us, they give us well-intentioned messages at that time. But when we become adults, we need to question some of those things that have come up. So that's one part of it. And actually, uh, brain scientists call it the fast brain and the slow brain. Of course, they, they have fancier names than that, but essentially, that's the easy, easy way to talk about it. Our fast brain has all those biases there. And like I said, some of them help us get through the get through the day. Like our parents taught us to look left and right before we and left again before we cross the street. So we get those messages. And then when we're adults, if we're willing to be analytical, if we're willing to work at not being biased and stereotypical, when one of those bias messages comes up from our fast brain. And our fast brain is our reptilian brain, just so that listeners, right. you know, understand it's 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 that part of our brain that's trying to keep us safe, that's always looking to see what's going on out there. So that's why we have those messages there. So so that bias comes up. And in this case with with your opening uh, on the vignette that I had used in a in a workshop, we see a a Muslim, we see a person dressed as a Muslim. And whatever stereotypes or biases that we have in our psyche, because of how we've been bombarded by everything around us, the media, other people's comments, our own experience, and whatever we went through during 9-11, all of that comes up for a nanosecond. If we're really working at not being biased and stereotype, typical, when we see that Muslim person, then our slow brain, the analytical part of our brain, would say that the fast stuff would still come up. Oh, it could be a terrorist. That could come up. But then we could say, wait a minute. What's the circumstance I'm in right now? I'm, I'm in a classroom situation or I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's someone who just got hired into my department. And surely the people who had to interview this person and, and in a police department situation, he had to pass a whole lot of tests and go through all kinds of examinations. So uh, let me calm that down for a moment. And then here's the next step. Let me get to know the individual. Let's stop at this point. My guest is Lenora Billings-Harris. She has presented to audiences on six continents, plus in the middle of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. We're talking about uh, uh, bias, diversity, uh, racial stereotypes, etc. And we will be right back with Straight Talk Radio. And this is Chuck Gallagher with Lenora Billings Harris, and we're back on Straight Talk Radio. And Lenora, you were talking about uh, fast brain, slow brain, the kind of what comes in head and what's that immediate response, fast brain, and then slowing it down and taking the time. And, and I have to say to you, we talked a little bit about the NSA convention and this last convention. Uh, as as the as the convention was winding down, apparently there was another convention that was taking place, and it involved lots of little people. And I'm not talking about children. I'm talking about small people. And <laughs> you know, in the world that we live in today, what you used to be able to say, you can't say because it's not politically correct. Now, the unpolitically correct comment would be midgets. But the politically correct would be little people. Mm -hmm. But I, I walk out into, um, into this hallway as, as all these little folks were gathering for their convention, and <laughs> your phone went off to the Wizard of Oz. And so when I walked out, I hit my wife, and we were back a ways, and I said, I want to sing. We represent the lollipop kids, the lollipop kids, because that was such a brilliant part of the Wizard of Oz. And my wife looked at me, and that was the fast brain. Mm -hmm. The slow brain was, Chuck, you better not do that because, one, you, you, you will be mob attacked, duct taped <laughs> to the floor. Somebody with a camera is going to catch that. Say you're politically insensitive and your speaking career would be shot. <laughs> so, you know, it's like I understand what the impulse was. The question is, do we act on impulse? Yes. Well, and here's the, here's the second part of that, is we live in a world of political correctness, and I, cer certainly I think more so in the U.S. than anywhere else, 
And it's a challenge. I mean, I, I do this work. My focus on diversity and inclusion is 24 seven and I don't get it right all the time. And so one of the things that I, that I try to help people understand is it's not about just finding the right word because you're never going to always get it right. However, if we consider that the reason the words change, like why we now say little people or why we now say actually one of the ones that's in transition right now is Latino. It's more appropriate to say Latino than it is Hispanic. Um, some black people prefer being called black. Some prefer being called African-American. But they all come from a place where the people in the group have then said, I want to be called, in this case, little people. And if we're wanting to be inclusive, which is the more important, the most important part of diversity and inclusion, right. if we wanted to be inclusive and respectful, then how much effort does it take once we learn the right word to use the more appropriate word? But I, right. but I got to tell you, I get lots of pushback on that. Oh, why can't we just all be American. Well, because some are more American than others based on the stereotypical picture in our head. You know, Lenora, th there's, a, there's, there's a lot of things I really want to talk to you about. And, and one of them is, and I want to go, I'm curious to, to, to get your response to this, because I have to admit, I, I'm honestly conflicted a, a bit. If you go back, I don't know, it's probably been a year and a year and a half, maybe two years ago. But if you go back to the Paula Deen issue, Okay, so here you have, and you and I are both baby boomers, so you have a baby boomer plus a little in Paula Dean, who was raised in the, I'm going to call Deep South, mm -hmm. which everyone has to recognize was really a racial trigger. I mean, you know, in, in, in all honesty, we've only been 130-some years since the Civil War, so if you were in... Charleston or Savannah or the the Deep South, which was really connected to slavery, and you're several generations away from that, I would venture to say that most every human, black, white, whatever, that it was in the Deep South has used racially inappropriate terms. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what what I'm challenged by is, so you're asked to tell the truth. Have you ever used racially inappropriate terms? And she says, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm going to say this. I don't know Paula Dean, therefore I don't know the truth. But she said, yes, years ago I did, mm -hmm. but, but I don't today. Okay. Then all of a sudden there is this swell of emotion today that says, oh my goodness, we have to pull her sponsorships, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, well, I don't get it. If she lied, she might be able to keep her sponsorships, but people would say, well, she had to be lying. If she tells the truth, <laughs> yeah. she's punished. Yeah. But the truth is everybody has done that if you're old enough in the Deep South. So how do you, how do you reconcile the truth to a consequence that happens 30, 40 years later. So, uh, that particular circumstance was one that as it unfolded, I, I really did feel bad for Paula Dean because to your point, she was asked a question. She, she told the truth. Yes, I used it in the past. And many of the people that know her came out and said, but today that is not the person that she is. She never would use those terms. What, what my belief is, or, you know, as I evaluate these things that happen, is that, especially uh, in the media, sponsors are afraid that if they don't pull their sponsorship, that they then will, you know, lose profitability. So uh, yet again, with that fast brain, slow brain, sometimes I think the reaction by supporters, in this case sponsors, in, in situations like that is a little too fast. Here's the challenge. Every situation is different. Right. And there certainly have been many circumstances on TV where a sportscaster, more often than not it's in sports, a sportscaster or somebody in sports says something that's highly insensitive and then they, you know, they get censored or, or fined or whatever the case may be. And I think we really do have to look at each one individually. Paula Dean got stuck in a time warp 
Yes, she did some things in the past, but now she's being punished for it. Um, and 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 people can say, well, well, is that fair? What? First of all, when I hear people saying, you know, that's not fair, my first response is, you know what? Nobody ever said life was fair. Amen, so, sister. Yeah. So we got to consider that, and then consider the individual and the circumstances instead of yet again lumping all people together. Everybody that uses the N-word therefore must be racist. Well, hello, there's an awful lot of black people that use it. Now, let me be clear. It is never acceptable as far as I'm concerned, but I know that millennials and rappers and um, hip hoppers, they say they use it to reclaim that word. Well, I don't come from that era. I come from the era where there is no way you can reclaim that word and make it positive. But I do have to consider their reality. So what I can then do, what all of us could do, is to say to an individual, not to a group, but to an individual, and I had to do this with a friend of mine once who uses that word quite often, and I said to her, you know, that word is so highly offensive to me that when we are together... I would appreciate it if you didn't use it. In fact, one of the things that I get busy doing in my own work is I teach people how to give that kind of feedback and not lose the friend. So I could say to her, I, I have no control over what you do when I'm not around, but if you would be willing to not use that word in my presence, I'd be appreciative of that. And then thank her when I recognize she doesn't use it. Most people won't do that. It's so much easier to just be mad and to just label people. Right. You know, it's interesting, Lenore, we've got about two minutes, but um, as I said, I'm not particularly proud of my past. However, our, all of our pasts create the person that we are today. And the question is, what do we do with that? But I'll never forget um, walking into federal prison and my um, cellmate was a, a, a little bit shorter than I was. He was an African-American guy and we developed a quick friendship. And it was really interesting because most of the uh, African-American inmates use the N-word. But he looked at me one day, and not that I would because I didn't want to get beat up, but he looked at me one day and he said, Chuck, he said, it's okay for me to do that. It will never be okay for you to do that. Exactly. And, you know, it was like, well, dude, you don't have to worry about that because, <laughs> you know, I just want to survive this little experience here. I don't want to be somebody's well, girlfriend, but, you know. One of the things that I that I say to folks is because there are some people that get angry. It's like, well, why why is it okay for you, you know, a black person, to use it, but it's not okay for me to use it? And one a couple things I say. One one of which is, you know, it's okay for me to talk about my mama, and maybe I won't be saying kind things all the time, but it is never okay for you to talk about my mama. It's right. the same kind of thing. But what I say to, in this case, black people relative to that word, is when you use the term, especially in mixed company, you confuse people who are not black. Because if you use the term all the time, they some people will then think, oh, okay, it's okay for me to use the term. They, they won't right. know better. So right. err on the conservative side. Just don't use it. Absolutely. This is uh, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. My guest is Lenora Billings Harris. She is an author, international speaker, and consultant who specializes in diversity and and making that a competitive advantage in your organization. When we get back after the break, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the current topics that are out there. This past year with with Ferguson, and then going into 2015 with the um, uh, murder of three Muslim folks in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It is obviously a hot topic and a hot time to talk about um, diversity in the United States of America. So we'll be back in just a moment. And we're back from our break. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. My guest is Lenora Billings-Harris. She is uh, the queen of diversity, as I put it, she is one of the people, in fact, one of the few people in the United States that if you were sitting as an as an organization or as a company and you said, you know, gosh, um, it, it's a mixture of people in the United States. How can we take different people from different perspectives, bring them together and make it effective? Mm -hmm. And and I want to say as a, as a baby boomer, um, you know, that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we as a generation have because we are now clearly uh, typically in the top ranks of executives in the company, in the country. 
And yet we are dealing with people who are in their 20s and 30s that see the world very differently than we see the world and have very different attitudes towards uh, other people and inclusion of other people. And if we don't learn how to get that right, we will move on and other people will figure that out. So, Lenora, it is such an honor to have you on the show. We were Talking about uh, Paula Dean and some of the issues in the country and, and things that pop up, I, I guess probably one of the ones that really caught the attention uh, of the country was what took place in Ferguson. And, and that wasn't the only thing that happened. I mean, you, you also had the um, uh, police officer in New York who uh, had the fatal chokehold on uh, Eric Garner. Um, so there were all kinds of things that were seen, and it seemed like the police were... Um, some would call it out of control. Mm -hmm. And it, so there was a, a really interesting article that came up that said that black Americans trust the criminal trust in the criminal justice system is probably as low as it has ever been mm -hmm. and and is dropping. Um, and it, it's fascinating because the, 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 the survey said black Americans are 23 points more likely than whites to say there's police brutality in their area. They're 45 points points more likely to say that police treat blacks and whites different and 50 points more likely to say that the same cr cr criminal justice system is unfair to blacks versus whites. Um, it's sad mm -hmm. to see that and yet I have to say from a personal perspective and now this goes back almost 20 years, that seemed to be true and I don't think it's changed a lot today. As an African-American female, what's your perspective? How do you see this? Mm -hmm. So I look at it from a couple of angles, one being an African-American female and another because my area focuses diversity and inclusion. Right. From an African-American female perspective, what I know to be true is that African-American men experience racism far more than any other group I know of. From my own experience with my own families, um, there is no black family that I know of that has a son that does not, by the time that boy is 11 or 12, that does not sit him down and say, we need to talk about what your behavior needs to be if you're ever stopped by a police officer. And when I share that with mixed groups, you know, when I'm, when I'm speaking, presenting, uh, people who are not African-American are very surprised by it. Well, it's been that way for a long time. Now, right. some people can say, oh, well, you know, if, if the black person wasn't doing something bad, then you, they wouldn't get in trouble, they wouldn't get shot, they wouldn't, whatever, you know? And, I, and here's, here's my cut on that. If you are the person involved, or if you're a family member involved, there is nothing anybody can say that is going to make you feel differently about wh whatever your beliefs are relative to racism. However, I think the disconnect is for those that want to deny that there is more racist behavior um, um, uh, by some police officers towards black people than the, the, or different behavior, I should say, towards people of color than it is toward a person who is of the same color. The, the disconnect is the statistics show it to be true. I mean, when you, right. you shared with our listeners that you've been in a federal prison, well, when you look at those numbers, when you look at the population in the United States and then the population that is incarcerated and take it outside of that and look at in the work environment, what black women are paid versus black men versus white men and who is getting promoted. When you look at all those statistics, it's... I'm hard pressed to come away from that saying, oh, no, it's it's not about uh, racism. What I will say, however, is most of the time it is not intentional racism. What I mean by that is people are acting quickly and they're not taking the time to learn about people different than them. With all these things that happened this this uh, summer, I felt a need to reach out to some of the police officers that I know so that I could get a balanced opinion. And what I learned was that 
when black people say, see a police officer coming and they raise their hands right away, that offends the white police officer. And the reason is, I am told, is, you know, if we stop your car, we can't see what color you are when right. we're making that decision. I mean, you're going by too fast. So we're not stopping for that reason. But what they also told me was they react a lot based on how that individual is, is responding to them. So if you're not calm and all of that, then that's going to that's going to raise the raise the tension as you know and and I'll n not be so long-winded on this as as you know I am doing some work with police officers as well as municipalities in general I think there are many that don't want to be the next Ferguson and right. I, I am I am comforted in knowing that there are police officers firefighters and other people that deal with the public uh, in the, in that way who not only want to do a good job and want to be open-minded and inclusive, there are many that want to learn how to be more open and inclusive. Because it's not going to happen without some level of awareness. You have to make that intention. You know, it was interesting, Lenora, and um, I, I'm not even sure exactly how to how to say what the feeling was, but it was fascinating uh, during the experience I had in prison, and this is not about that, but it was fascinating when, when I became a minority to watch um, different groups and, and their actions and reactions and their biases. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was really, it, it, was, it was incredible because uh, the, uh, uh, the Hispanic or Latino group had a certain bias. The African American group had a certain bias. Um, the white group had a certain bias, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and a lot of it was a function of what the educational level was. Yes, because you you could see, bluntly put, you could see an educated white guy thinking, you know, I just probably need to kind of hang to myself and, and and not instigate something that would make it unsafe. Mm -hmm. You could see a now, this is a racially sensitive term, but, you know, a redneck white guy who would be like, okay, pop a beer and let's bring it on. Mm -hmm. You could see the angry black man who is like, you know, well, the system has kept me down. Well, anger's not going to get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and you could see the Latino who said, well, but there's strength in numbers, and in numbers we can be powerful, which goes to the whole issue of, of gangs, regardless of the color. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a fascinating experience to watch. The, the, the unfortunate thing was, the more educated we found people of any race, the more easily it was to integrate and carry on a dialogue and, and actually talk and, 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 and have some connection that made sense. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely with the importance of education in this regard because what happens the more you learn about groups different than you, the, the more you have um, cognitive dissonance, you, a, a disconnect. So you have that bias that comes up and you're like, well, wait a minute, that wasn't my experience. Whether it was experience because you watched several movies that had to do with people that you're trying to learn about or people that you interact with. So when I'm working with groups, I, I share with them that for us to move forward and to get to a place where we're not just constantly killing each other, we have to take four steps. The first of which is knowledge. So choose a group that you don't know much about and, fi and decide you want to learn about them. And in today's world, it's so easy because of the Internet. So you can right. get lots of information. You can, um, you know, go to movies that are focused on Latinos or focused on little people or focused on LGBT, whatever it is, um, so that you can see them as individuals who happen to have something in common, which might be their race or their gender or their ethnicity, uh, whatever. The next step is understanding. And that's what you experienced when you were in prison, because you, you had to, because you were faced with all, all these people that were different than you, and you had to figure out how to survive. So you also got to know them. You got to know what their, as a group, what their biases might be, as well as what, what some individuals within those groups were like that maybe were not like whatever the bias was, then the right. next step is acceptance. And acceptance has nothing to do with, okay, I like you. It simply means I accept the fact that this world is diverse 
And for me to be effective in it, I accept that there are people in it that don't see things the way I do, that don't believe the way I believe. I still need to find my way of showing respect. And then that takes us to behavior, which is the last step. And that's when I decide how I'm going to respond to a situation rather than react to a situation. You know, it's interesting, Lenore, and, and we're going to wrap this segment up here in just a second. But I, but I have to tell you, uh, during the little time that or the time that I was in prison, uh, I was in a choir. Uh, and um, there was one day a year when families could actually come and visit. And, and the inmates lived for that one day when somebody could come and say, you know, I care about you and I'm going to be there. Well, the director of the choir, and everyone was African-American in the choir but me. And, and I had to learn to sway. And I wasn't really good at that. So I had to get this deal down. But, but the funny part about it was is the director uh, decided he was going to get into a contest with the, with the warden over the use of Jesus. Now, the warden said, we don't care what you sing, but it can't be specific to any religion. So call it God. Mm -hmm. And the director said, not going to do it. It's Jesus or nothing. So he resigned, and we were about to not have the opportunity to perform. I got elected to be the spokesperson to the warden, and we agreed to use the word God, which was such an easy decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I became the first white director of a black choir in prison, and it was so much fun. I had a blast. <laughs> and, you know, there's some things in life that you remember fondly, and that's one of them. This is Chuck oh. Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. We will be back in a minute with my guest, Lenora Billings-Harris. It's so much fun. We'll be back. Stick with us. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and I have to tell you, you know, I, I love doing these shows, but this has been a lot of fun. My uh, my guest is Lenora Billings Harris. She is a certified speaking professional. She do does consultations with organizations all around. She has two books. Uh, the first, the Diversity Advantage: A Guide to Making Diversity Work. A Guide to Making diversity work. And Trailblazers, how top business leaders are accelerating results through inclusion and diversity. And Lenora, I, I've had the opportunity um, to be a senior VP of sales and marketing in one public company, now a vice president in another public company. And, and I know one of the things that becomes a challenge as time goes on and as we start hiring people of clearly of different ages in the workforce, man, there's a different expectation amongst employees and and, and, and the sensitivity to what they're looking for. So mm -hmm. help us look at what are some of the current challenges that organizations have when it comes to inclusion and diversity and, and, and stereotypes and, and racism? Mm -hmm. So so I think the biggest mistake that organizations make when they recognize that they may be uh, losing a segment of the market or not penetrating a segment of the market and they want to get more into that market so they decide okay we need to have more diversity within our organization the mistake they made is make is the first thing they do is go out and recruit wrong big mistake the first thing they need to do is to create that internal environment that will be receptive to people coming into it who are not like the people there for a quick example is I've worked with an engineering company not that long ago and they were intentional about wanting to have millennials come join them and, and their tenure of the people there, most people were there for 20 and 30 years and they were all white guys. So mm -hmm. they started hiring people of difference and it was a revolving door. And the reason was because they hadn't prepared the people who were already there, prepare through training, through uh, any multitude of things that I help my um, clients learn that they can do. So that's number one is, is look at that internal environment. The second is to recognize that diversity really means all of us, uh, although we tend to use it from a perspective of talking about women or people of color or uh, LGBT, that type of thing, really all of us are diverse because no two of us have have experienced the world the same so we need to kind of check our own biases about who's different and then create that culture that is inclusive and respectful and then the leaders need to also learn how to support value support and value diversity in the organization how to articulate that not just about numbers and that's really what takes up most of my consulting work is to help them in that regard 
You know, Lenore, it's it's kind of fascinating because I think the um, big tech firms, um, Apple, uh, Google, Facebook, you, you know, they're all people are saying, well, what's the diverse makeup of your organization? And and you're not diverse enough. And, and it's like, I, maybe I'm going to say this, maybe I'm missing it. But, you know, if you are Apple computer, anybody that's really, 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 really good wants to work at Apple computer. It's not in Maybe I'm missing it, but it doesn't seem that it's, well, let's just discriminate against people. It's they hire the, the, the top, the best of the best. So how do, how, do you, how do you talk to an Apple or a Facebook or a Google or whatever that says, you know, we're hiring the best of the best, and then people criticize us because, well, you don't have enough Latinos or you don't have enough people of color or you don't have enough of LGBT? Well, Mm-hmm. Why would I go out to search for a group? Why don't I just search for the best people? And they naturally come. Well, here's the thing. Unfortunately, and we don't have enough time to go into all the reasons why, but unfortunately, in this country in particular, and I'm finding it to be so in other countries that followed U.S. example and did some of the same wrong things, is that first what came about was EEO, Equal Employment Opportunity. Then came Affirmative Action. And then came diversity. And a lot of companies renamed their affirmative action and EEO things, which are compliance, government compliance. They just renamed it to call it diversity. Diversity has to do with business results, where the other two have to do with compliance, bare minimum. And so that created this, this disconnect in the workplace. So when you go after the best person, what people tend to think is if you hire somebody who is quote unquote diverse, you lowered your standards. So people mm-hmm. automatically assume certain folks are not going to be as qualified. The bigger issue, I think, for tech firms, which uh, tech companies, which you know, there have been articles about how they're not as diverse as, as some people think they should be, is that if they want more diversity, and, and why would they want diversity? Because diversity of thought creates more in, in, uh, innovation, it solves problems faster. So if they want the best talent and they don't have diversity, they're not getting the best talent, but they can do things to help that seven-year-old, that eight-year-old, that 11-year-old know that technology is an avenue that they could follow and become very successful. If they're not reaching deep into the communities around the country and around the world, then some of those kids just never know that that, that that's an opportunity. And therefore, they don't major in it. If they go to college, they don't major in those things. You know, it's fascinating that you say that because one of the truths that I I truly do believe is there are so many opportunities for companies that now it seems like billion is the norm, not million, (laughs) but that have billions of dollars could literally transform areas through education if they start young enough. And it's not as if they don't have the capital to be able to really change the lives of people. Um, but before we but before we go, we only have a few minutes. I, I do want to ask this question of you. You have been very open, and I'm very much appreciative. It obviously seems that the younger generations, the people, and I'm going to call it the people who were in their uh, late teens, mid-teens to mid-twenties, seem to have less uh, racial um, biases than certainly people who are baby boomers. Um, it, it appears we've done something right. Is that um, here's the thing. People will say uh, millennials, um, they, they just don't have any, you know, any issues or, you know, any biases uh, or any racial biases. Millennials or younger people, they do have biases. They're just different than those from the baby boomers because their experience is different. Those millennials grew up in a world where they already, depending on how old they are, they always were around technology. They, the world was very small, so they were more accustomed to seeing people of color, for instance. So they will notice if there is no diversity amongst a group. Whereas a baby boomer, if you've been around all black people or all white people, it might take you a minute to, oh, right, there's, some, there's, there's something missing there. But the, the younger folks have, my point is, all of us do have biases. Theirs are just different. And so if, if organizations want to hire the best talent and they're looking at millennials, then there's yet another reason that their workplace needs to be inclusive and diverse because millennials will go somewhere else, regardless of 
what their personal makeup is because they're comfortable in that environment where there are people with piercings and their um, different sexual orientations and their different colors. That's what they're comfortable with. You know, it's fascinating. I think this is, um, with the short time we have left, first, I want to say, look, Lenora, thank you for taking the time to, to, to be with us. My guest has been Lenora Billings-Harris. She has two books. I'm going to suggest you go to Amazon and check them out. The Diversity Advantage, A Guide to Making Diversity Work, and Trailblazers, How Top Business Leaders Are Accelerating Results Through Inclusion and Diversity. Lenora is certainly a leader, and, and I'm going to suggest that you go to her website. Now, first, I want you, Lenora, to pronounce it for me. Ubuntu Global. Ubuntu Global. Now I'm going to spell it because you'll never get it. U B U N T U Global.com. Let me say it again. U B U N T U Global.com. Check out Lenora there. The website is great. What she writes really is profound and it connects with people in ways to cause you to think different. And I think probably, Lenora, that's what's made you a. a international celebrity when it comes to diversity. Thank you for taking the time to be here. And remember, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. And as I say every time, every choice we make in life has a consequence. And if you're Paula Dean, the reality is sometimes those consequences come 30 years late. Mm. Thanks for taking time to be with us and join us again next week on Straight Talk Radio. (laughs) 